Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our My Healthy Minutes segment brought to us by Revere Securities, we're featuring returning guest, Dr. David Rankin, founder of Aqua Plastic Surgery in Jupiter, Florida, and the chief of plastic surgery at St. Mary's Medical Center in West Palm Beach. Now, Dr. Rankin has been in practice for 19 years. But in recent years, he has become very well known in the breast implant illness community. Now, interestingly enough, Dr. Rankin stopped implanting women four years ago to focus on specializing in explanting procedures. And over the past decade or so, more than 350,000 people in the U.S. have reported adverse events related to silicone gel breast implants to the FDA. Now, their complaints range from autoimmune symptoms to a rare cancer called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Now, despite the number and severity of the issues described, the experiences of such patients have long been ignored. And the famous among them land in the page sixes of the world. Bachelorette star Claire Crawley says her implants caused crazy health problems, while Danica Patrick reported hair breakage and heavy metal toxicity. Both documented their removal surgeries on Instagram. But for many, the confusion around what's now called BII, breast implant illness, has left them to suffer alone. And to date, breast implant illness remains the most controversial subject in aesthetic and reconstructive breast surgery. While sick implant recipients are still written off as crazy and BII is not a recognized medical condition, researchers are starting to document the reasons and ways that the body might rebel against an implant. Now, but it's unclear how often these ill effects of implants occur. Among sources that accept that they happen all the time, estimates vary between a small percentage all the way up to one in five women. And here to chat some more is Dr. David Rankin. Welcome to the show, my dear friend. Hi, uh, thanks, Zen. Very nice to be here again. So nice to have you back on. All right, let's dive into this. If you go back um, in the early 1990s, the FDA banned silicone breast implants in response to public concerns about health risks, including cancer, connective tissue diseases, and autoimmune disorders. And later, research found no link between breast implants and these diseases. How did they make their way back on the market? Well, I think what we're seeing is kind of a, a full circle of events. Um, we're seeing the same symptoms that were present back then, um, same presentations with women. Um, there was a period of time where the implants went off the market, were reconstituted to what the industry determined to be a safer material, um, safer silicone polymers. Um, they went through a study with the FDA and uh, lo and behold, and November of, I think it was 2006, they were put back on the market. And now we're kind of seeing the same same types of situations that developed in the past. Wow. And, you know, back, if you look at the research, since 1982, patients had been, uh, been suing implant manufacturers in court with millions of dollars um, awarded in damages. And in June of 1988, cancer patient turned uh, consumer advocate Sybil Goldridge. She wrote her uh, restoration drama in an essay for MS magazine, helping to bring what would eventually be called BII to national attention. And following two mastectomies, her body rejected multiple implants in increasingly painful ways. So, you know, this is not really new, but it's been buried uh, for whatever reasons, right? Um, but moving on to, I have a very specific question here, because public consensus on, on the risk posed by BII seemed always just out of reach, Dr. Rankin, but currently the lawsuits against implant manufacturers, uh, for example, are still described in some medical and legal literature as aesthetically dubious, unfair to the targeted corporations, and not based on scientific evidence. What do you say to this? Well, I think that there um, is credibility um, developing um, as recently as 2021. The Food and Drug Administration came up with some new recommendations on um, things that women should be presented when getting breast implants. Um, I know we're going to talk about uh, black box warning, yeah. which um, I think is, is important that the FDA recommends. Um, and what a black box warning is, it's, it's the highest safety warning that a medication or device can have um, put on it by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, they also determine patients should have a 
decision-making checklist presented to them when getting breast implants, which goes over things like possible development of BIA ALCL, which is a, a lymphoma type um, disease that can, can develop um, uh, breast implant illness symptoms. Um, patients should be told these things can develop also. There's new screening recommendations for women with silicone as far as monitoring with through the use of MRI and ultrasound. Um, and patients are also given now a list of the ingredients within the implants, within the shell, and within the gel to know what's going into their bodies to make a more informed decision. Yeah. So why aren't surgeons reviewing this warning more carefully with their patients? I mean, uh, I literally walked into a doctor's office um, not long ago, and I was trying to see if I should have my breast implants replaced. And not once did this man ever mention to me the black box warning. Um, and it was more of, of that's when I decided that I was no longer going to be pursuing that um, that doctor uh, to be able to take care of me. But we then had a first interview together with Susanna DeMuni. And then I realized that if the doctors aren't giving you this, this message loud and clear, um, then obviously they're in it for the money. Uh, because that is a big, big decision making factor for most women. And if you ask most women who have had implants, the doctor never once mentioned the black box warning. Uh, but so yes, thank you for saying that. Um, is there a link between medical grade silicone implants and any disease at this point? Um, you know, it's, it's still nothing concrete in the literature. Um, so we don't know the, the cause and the effect and the relationship that they have. Um, I think it can be made a, an argument that women with breast implants do develop these symptoms. So there has to be some mechanism of action, which is being further explored right now. Yeah, I mean, look, I have saline implants and I've had them for 11 years. I have no symptoms and no issues. Um, so a woman in my situation, do I need to replace them? And if I do and decide to go all natural, what procedures exist to fill my what will then be deflated breast if I remove them? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough decision for women, for sure, because you put an implant, you expand tissues over time and to remove that volume aesthetically, that's really it becomes a big issue if you have a lot of your own breast tissue then you can remove the implant, maybe do a lift, maybe not, and, and get a good aesthetic result. But the really challenging patients are women with medium to larger implants and very thin breast tissues. Um, if you remove the implants in those situations, uh, you could have a, a poor aesthetic result. Um, there's not a ton of options out there. There is fat grafting where you can uh, do liposuction, take that fat and inject it into a patient's breast to give more volume. I think lifting is important, um, not necessarily always to lift the areola and nipple, but just to t tighten the skin, you know, tighten the skin that, yeah. that, that after removing that volume. Hmm. So when you think of the term breast implant illness, um, it's, it's both controversial and very poorly understood, in my opinion, after speaking to many people. And there are no diagnostic tests or diagnostic criteria. And many doctors cite medical literature that says there's no straight line connection, so to speak, between the symptoms women are experiencing and their implants. What are some of the major symptoms reported to you by your patients? So there's, there's a ton, um, but um, skin rashes are very common, brain fog, depression, joint pain. Those are the ones that you can find right on the FDA's website as well. Um, but I do see hair loss, exacerbation of autoimmune issues, often through thyroid, lupus, Sjogren's. If you read the fine print on some of the manufacturer's paperwork, some of these things are listed um, as well as, as possible side effects. Craziness. I, I can't even believe that we're at where we are today with our, our technology. And this is still a mystery to, to people. Um, you know, surgeons have been augmenting breasts since at least the late 19th century. Often, I was reading about this with really disastrous results, Dr. Rankin. The early days involved implants. I didn't know this. It made from ivory, wood chips, and even uh, balled up plastic tape. And then silicone gel, gel implants, I think were introduced in the market in the 60s. They promised, you know, a safer alternative in the form of this medical grade prosthesis, but they've since become increasingly commonplace, making up the majority of 1.8 million breast augmentations and hundreds of thousands of breast reconstructions. So the numbers are staggering because you have all these women out there with breast implants and a majority of them. Um, bringing me to another question. So if you look at the, the bird's eye view from 
from your perspective where you're intaking all these women that are wanting to explant, does implant removal improve a patient's symptoms or cure a patient who's been medically diagnosed, um, you know, a, like with an autoimmune disease, so to speak? And are they at, at more susceptible than regular women who don't have any autoimmune disease? Well, I do see a, a huge benefit from the patients in my practice. Um, I always say about 85% of my patients do feel better after explanting. Yeah. Um, so that's a big, big number. Um, as far as does it cure some of the problems that they're having from an autoimmune standpoint, I have seen some of their numbers like um, ANA, which is a, you know, a marker for autoimmune problems get better. I've seen thyroid issues resolve. So I have seen some evidence-based distinct lab work get better. Um, but beyond that, they usually feel better, uh, more energetic, less joint pain, less hair loss, uh, rashes go away, food intolerances. So there, there's a multitude of things that do go away in most women, not everybody, because you can't say that every problem you come up with is related to your breast implants. Um, but oftentimes, many of them are. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because now you're telling me that there is verifiable evidence clinical evidence that things are improving after these women are explanting. So, you know, it's, I'm curious to know as to why that evidence is not taken into consideration. And this breast implant illness seems to be, you know, plaguing so many women and it's a mystery. I mean, there's doctors like you out there that clearly are seeing the evidence right in front of your eyes. Yeah. I mean, I see it on a day to day by day basis. Um, women do not get breast implants wanting to eventually remove them. So this is often a, a, a final thing. They're struggling with their health and they ha they almost have to do this and they do it and lo and behold, they feel better. So um, that's, that's the great thing about doing what I do. Of course, absolutely. And, um, you know, what needs to be done when a patient complains about breast implant illness? Are you explanting right away? Or are you going down a list of things and crossing them off before you just make the decision? Well, you know, the patients make the decision for themselves. And many of these patients have been to many specialists. They've been to the emergency rooms. They've been to doctor after doctor. And nobody can really give them a diagnosis or an explanation. Yeah. And then they're told about breast implant illness and, and that's how we move forward. Yep. So, yeah. So if after the discussion of risks and the possibility of no improvement of symptoms post explantation is discussed with a patient, um, what should be done if the patient demands um, an end block, so to speak, or a total um, capsulectomy with their explantation, um, do you just proceed and, and tell them, hey, that that, that's exactly what we're going to do for you? Or how do you evaluate um, if that's truly the case? Yeah, I mean, there's no test. There's no study. We can't do blood work. We can't do an ultrasound or MRI and say, yes, you have breast implant illness. So it's, it's almost a diagnosis of exclusion when everything else has already been ruled out. Um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we will send to specialists and, and do evaluations and blood work to see if maybe something else is causing the problem first. And in your medical opinion, can breast implant illness lead to death? Um, well, not necessarily. Um, if you do develop um, the, the lymphoma, that can lead to death um, if it's undetected and untreated. So um, luckily, that is a very, very rare thing. We don't see it very often, but the patients that do have it, you know, it's, that, that's a big problem. But it really is, um, you know, it's a lot of my patients, they do... They lay in bed, they don't work, they have trouble doing day-to-day -day activities. So for those patients, um, it's pretty severe. Got it. Well, listen, we're out of time, but what an enlightening segment. I always love talking to you because you're just like the voice of reason uh, for many women who have been deemed crazy. So thank you for coming on. It was such an honor speaking with you again. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guys, you definitely have to check out Dr. Rankin at aquaplasticsurgery.com. Check him out on the gram at David Rankin MD. And you can also check them out at Aqua Plastic Surgery. That was My Healthy Minutes brought to us by Revere Securities. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this.